hello and thanks so much for joining us. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America, and today we have the pleasure of talking with award-winning filmmaker Yoruba Richin. She is also director of the documentary program here at the Craig Newmark School of Journalism at the City University of New York, part of our family. She has been honored with Guggenheim and Fulbright fellowships, and she has a fascinating new film, The Green Book, Guide to Freedom, which can be seen on the Smithsonian Channel. Yoruba, thank you. Oh, my pleasure. It's so fun to be here. Thank you for being here. Thank you for, for putting me in your film. That's right. No, that, that, <laughs> it, it is, despite the fact, you know, that I have a small speaking part, uh, is a wonderful, wonderful documentary. Oh, thank you. based. Uh, on uh, Victor Green's wonderful, I mean, an overlooked character, a person in our history, uh, who really played a major part in African American life. Absolutely, not just an overlooked uh, person in our history, but an overlooked uh, document of our history, which is what I think makes the Green Book so rich and so um, fascinating for us. And such, uh, you know, to be able to mine the stories that are in those pages. Um, the, Green Book, the Green Book was, was published from 1936 to 1967, more than uh, around 9,500 listings uh, all over the country, all over the world, actually. So it's a really rich document. Um, and so many stories to tell. Yeah, and as we have this conversation, we should say that it is available at the Schomburg and online, et, et, et cetera. But if you want to buy an original copy of uh, the Green Book, it'll cost you what, 22? That, yeah, that was the last, I think, price that it was sold for, $22,000. $22,000. Yeah. So being revered, even though it's a part of our history and overlooked for so long, is now an item of, uh, of great worth, uh, right. as well as it should be. I'm surprised that he started it as early as 1936. I know. Um, yeah, 1936 was the first edition. And it was really the dawn of the automobile. I mean, that is when, uh, you know, right when Ford started mass producing cars, when cars were uh, becoming more co a common way of travel. And so, you know, he was right on that, right on that. Yeah, and that black people would buy their car Absolutely. almost before a home because of the segregated public transportation. Exactly. So the dawn of the automobile, and this is what I discovered in making the film, the dawn of the automobile was something um, that African Americans not only took part of in order to, um, as you said, escape the, the segregated and humiliation mm -hmm. of public transportation at the time, but also was an industry that employed African Americans um, and really was a key part of lifting African Americans to the middle class. Yeah, and I was struck, I'd never seen this before, but saw it in your film of, about the uh, oil companies, like Esso then, now Exxon, that actually hired black marketing people to make sure that black drivers stopped at, black, at uh, Esso uh, gas stations for their gas. Absolutely, so Esso was owned by Standard Oil, which is now Exxon, uh, but Standard Oil was owned by the Rockefellers. Uh, I forget exactly which, which one of the Rockefellers, but one of the Rockefellers. And, um, and you know, there is a history of, of progressivism in the Rockefeller, uh, you know, Rockefeller, um, legacy. And he was married to a woman whose last name uh, was Spellman, who came from a, a family of abolitionists. Mm -hmm. And Spellman, as you know, was, um, they, you know, endowed the Spellman, Spellman University. College, yes. Right. Now University, right? Spellman right. University. And so there's a history of progressivism. And Esso was very at the forefront of hiring black publicists, black chemists um, early on. Mm -hmm. And it, of course, distributed the Green Book. Right, right. And so we should say that, that for those who don't know, that uh, until recently, and maybe probably still, if you were a black person and traveling, but not just in the South, but anywhere in this country, you are not welcome in so many places. And so this book listed uh, the, some places. And we have, we have a small clip, and, and let's talk on the other side of that, sure. just to give you some idea. It's important to have everyone in this nation examine the significance of the Green Book. If you don't see the history, if you don't see where it was, how can you say it happened? 
Eventually, the Green Book would list more than 9,500 places between its pages. Today, only about a third of those sites are still standing. We need to find those places, and we need to see them, and we need to revere what they meant, because they made all of the difference to our survival. Carry your Green Book with you. You may need it. That is always so, it's chilling to me when he says, you may need it. <laughs> Absolutely. Because this was not, this was serious business. Yeah, this was serious business. Um, we talk about the film, in the film we talk about the, um, the, the dangers that African Americans face. Dangers on the road, which, you know, today we call driving while black. So a lot of this stuff is still relevant today. Uh, one of those dangers were sundown towns. Sundown towns were towns all across the country, mostly in the North and the West, mm -hmm. that uh, where African Americans had to get out before sundown. Um, and it was known, there were even signs sometimes or a bell that was rung that you know African Americans had to leave and were not welcome there. And th this, though, the, the, though sundown sound weren't listed in the Green Book, you knew that, you know, if if it's not if it's not in the Green Book, it may not be a good place to check to right, go. Right. Right. So it was places to stay overnight: restaurants, barber shops, liquor stores, all clubs, hotels, tourist what they call tourist homes, um, resorts. That's another big part of the, the I film. I love the Idlewild story. Yes. Talk to us about that. And of course, we're in the book because of my uncle's yes. hotel, the H.G. Gaston Hotel. Which we should talk about. That our audience may <laughs> know a little bit about from us from previous uh, iterations. But uh, he opened his motel in Birmingham, Alabama in 1954. Right. But some of the, so if you're talking about a green book that started in 1936, so he wasn't in the green book until 55 and, yep. and after. You know, but Idlewild, what I saw in your documentary, what was it like thousands of people yeah. who would come to this resort? Tell Again, it's another part of our history that we, you know, that we um, don't, don't know so much about, even though it was huge at the time. And of course, Idlewild wasn't the only place, it, only African-American resort, there, there were uh, many. But Idlewild was in Northwest Michigan, and it's, it is in Northwest Michigan, it still yeah. exists, yep. And um, African-American middle and upper class have been going there for decades. It started around 1910, actually. Um, and some of the you know, early developers were doctors and first heart surgeon who worked at the University of Chicago, uh, real estate developers, all African-Americans. So what's wonderful about the Green Book uh, is that it gives you this map um, of, you know, geographically where these places are, but also a map of our community. Um, the, the middle class, the upper class, seeking leisure and pleasure. You know, I, I always say that, I always want to point out that the Green Book, by the early 1940s, he, uh, Victor had titled it the um, Guide to Vacation, to Travel and Vacations. Ah. Uh. Right, so right, that right. was a key part of it too. It wasn't just about you know going to see the family exactly, yeah. or <laughs> about violence and right. just be. It's a it was a it was a way that we could go and have pleasure and recreation. Right. So I don't. But I, but I think one line is that how many thousands of people yes, on so the weekend? They said twenty five thousand. Twenty five thousand people yes. would show up. Absolutely. Because and then all the greats played there. All the greats. Right. You right. know Sarah Vaughn, uh, mm. Diane Carroll. Oh, I'm um, so sorry I missed those days, you know, but the notion. But on, on the, uh, in, in this area, the Northeast, we, of course, have Sag Harbor out on the island right. and Martha's and Vineyard, Martha's Vineyard yes. the Inkwell, yep. similar kind, uh, kinds of resorts, acceptable right. places where we wouldn't have to worry about and where we'd see other people, too, That's right. you know, a community. Right. Yep. Um, and could buy land and could actually buy land. I mean, right. people were, you know, had houses there. Talk to us about how you got to this story. I mean, you've made many films, and we'll talk about some of those uh, those others, but how did you come to this? Sure. And well, we, we talked, we met up with you in Birmingham. That's right. Great, great fun. Yes, great right. Fun. Um, so this is my third feature. I haven't made many yet. I'm still, <laughs> still on my way to making many. Um, but uh, so basically, I started working on this film in um, 
the not this past summer, but the summer before, and a production company, a British-based production company uh, Nate, called Impossible Factual, came to me, and they had the idea to do a film about this, about the Green Book. I had never heard of the Green Book, like many people, mm -hmm. um, and, but I was immediately fascinated and excited to uh, to work on this project. I mean, uh, for all the reasons that you know we just talked about. And then what happened, of course, is that a feature film uh, was made That's and right. a great, great deal of hoopla, many exactly. Oscar nominations, yes, and probably are, wins, which will, which is coming up, sure. Um, but uh, we didn't know about that. Right. We didn't know about that film. So it was this summer that we really started in earnest uh, doing our research and and filming, and um, we'd already done our filming, and I think that the Green Book premiered at the Toronto Film Festival in, uh, in August or September. And that's when, you know, we started, and won like the one, uh, one right, award. Right, right. So that's when we started seeing, oh gosh, okay, there's, gonna, there's a big fiction film called The Green Book that right. is coming out. It's a great, I call it a prequel to that's your right. documentary, you that's know, right. and you're booked everywhere for interviews up the kazoo yeah, everywhere. Now. So and we have these great, screenings. Great it's been deal. Fantastic. Great deal. A screening at the African American Museum in oh, DC yes, and wonderful. the Schomburg yes. and just tremendous deserved uh, attention. Um, I do want to ask you about the feature film. We have a clip of it. Uh, some of you may have, in the audience may have seen this already. Let's run this short clip of the feature film. Some guy called over here, a doctor. He's looking for a driver. You interested? I am not a medical doctor. I'm a musician. I'm about to embark on a concert tour in the Deep South. What other experience do you have? <laughs> so that, in essence, is the film. <laughs> but it's a, it's a two-person. It's about a, a, a well-educated classical pianist who's traveling through the South and needs a driver. And his Italian driver that he hires is a, you know, is good at the fisticuffs, etc. Mm -hmm. And and the Green Book places show up. They're really not the focal point. It's the relationship. What is, uh, what, what are, are your thoughts about that film? Sure. Um, well, I have to preface it by saying that I haven't seen it, um, and primarily because I've been like super sure. busy. <laughs> been do busy doing interviews, exactly. Being with do Black busy. America, that's and right, else. and finishing the film and all that. <laughs> but I will say that you know what what is very fortuitous is that it has, um, as you said, piqued the interest mm. of uh, you know of so many places, because uh, th that, even that it's called The Green Book, people now have a sense of what The Green Book is, mm -hmm. and they can c watch the film, my film, and really you know, dig deep and, and get the real story, um, the true story of The Green Book. And the other thing I will say, just reading about the criticism and you know, being in this industry, that I think um, a lot of the frustration, uh, a lot of our frustration as filmmakers comes um, because we feel we need to tell our own stories. We need to uh, be at the helm mm -hmm. of, you know, of creating the, the stories about our experience and about our history. And you know, this film was, uh, was written and directed by uh, white people. And um, you know, it has a specific lens. Yes, um, and the lens so, is definitely not yes. from, from the black perspective. Exactly. And unfortunately, it portrays the Green Book sites as, as under par, right, so to speak. Right, so. which is not true. I mean, yeah. you know, there were more than 9,500 listings, so there were a range. But for example, your uh, uncle's hotel. Right, right. You know? which, I mean, the finest African-American hotel uh, in the country. At one point, so you know it's it's frustrating and it's it's anger uh, inducing. Right. Um, so I understand you know what that what that criticism you know, that as, comes from. As Henri Treadwell uh, in your documentary, the piece that we ran was talking about earlier, it's the preservation of those places. So many of them have disappeared. Uh, my uncle's uh, motel is now in the process of being restored as part so of the exciting. Birmingham monument that President Obama created, the Civil Rights Monument. Amazing. But so many others are gone already, almost 10,000, right. um, and only a handful still left. That's right. And that's one of the, you know, the uh, things that we want people to, to take away from 
from the film, that these are places that, you know, even the few that do exist, you can still visit Idlewild. You know, there's, uh, uh, they're really trying to bring back events and, and energy and, and encourage people to buy, because that soil is rich, as one of the characters mm -hmm. says in the film. Um, but yes, many of them are gone. And, uh, you know, but I do think there's something really valuable, even knowing where these places were, even standing on that ground. Um, and so there's, Smithsonian is also doing a traveling exhibit mm -hmm. where they're going to, um, you know, they're gonna be diving more into that, where these places are, um, right. that, you know, even if they no longer exist, but where, you know, where they, where they were. The traveling exhibit and also putting interviews into the Smithsonian, a wonderful civil rights uh, uh, audio, you know, video yes. library that they have, Absolutely. which is just, you know, just incredible. So Victor Hugo Green, you know, now uh, uh, has, is becoming known. Uh, he was the other interesting aspect, and you had so many interesting, not only the automobile, but the fact that the way that he found places, he was a mail carrier himself and used his network, whoever thought about. It's crowdsourcing. I know. It's, it's, the, it's <laughs> the original crowdsourcing. You right, know, that's right. the way, yeah, exactly. He had his, his people on the ground right. um, who, uh, who al also distributed the book and encouraged business owners to advertise in the book as right, well. Right, right, um, And so they would report, you know, where these places are and people would send in. Uh, you know, ads for for their listings. Right. So uh, uh, they go into my new category of heroes. I always thought like the Pullman Porters, you know, were like really an, a crucial part of our history. And now the mail carriers That's right. who were gathering all of this information and, and, yep. uh, and sharing it. So let's talk a little bit about your other films. You got a lot of attention from The New Black. Yes. Let's talk a little bit about that. So The New Black, oh my gosh, it's so... So Time far is the... crazy, I know. <laughs> so The New Black uh, is a documentary that I made. It came out, it premiered in 2013, and it aired on uh, Independent Lens, PBS's Independent Lens in 2014. And it looks at the relationship between the African-American community and, um, and how they're grappling with the uh, marriage equality movement. And I basically follow a referendum that was in Maryland um, in 2012 and um, it became the first uh, voter-approved uh, marriage referendum that was passed. Um, and so I follow activists on both sides of the issue, people who are for, um, you know, for the, this amendment and who are advocating against it, who are both African-American. In Maryland, 30% um, of the vote is African-American, so it's a very important right, right, constitu constituency, and they, both sides were vying huge. for the black vote. Right, 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 both sides, yes. right, right. Well now, you know, recently I interviewed a minister from a very prominent black church and, you know, I assume that everybody is, or everybody I would know is supportive of marriage equality. And he said, quite frankly to me, no, you know, no way, you know, yeah. and I'm like shocked, yeah. you know, that someone at the head of a huge congregation like that would yeah. be so discriminative of, mm. you know, yeah. I mean, so, yeah, I mean, what I think was, what I think did happen at that time, uh, especially, is that it opened a conversation in our community about this issue. Um, you know, the fact that Obama, President Obama came out for marriage equality, mm -hmm. the NAACP, you know, there was, a, there's, there was a real movement that I think led to this mm -hmm. referendum being passed. I still think there's a lot of work to be, do, to be done, as there is in not just the black community, but in other, you know, especially religious, you know, institutions as, as well. And right. so, um, yes, you still have those those attitudes. A lot of a lot of work to be done. Um, and the Promised Land. So, Promised Land was my first film, my my baby. Yes. Um, and that uh, film looks at, which is actually still an issue today. <laughs> Speaking of lots of work still to be done, uh, but the efforts of the black indigenous community in South Africa to get their land back after apartheid. Wow. Um, apartheid was based on sure. the seizure of land, as right. you know, of black people. And I follow two communities that are, um, that are trying to get their land back. And also the white landowners mm -hmm. that do not want to 
um, give the, the land back. And really looking at um, how, you know, at that point, the film came out in 2010, and that was, uh, you know, I started the film 10 years after the end right, of apartheid. Sure. And where I really wanted to see how, um, where we were, you know, the promises that the ANC had made, the hope for the country. I've always been fascinated by South Africa. I was really yeah. trying to get a way to, to find a way to get there. Um, and so I was able to, you know, make to this do, film. To yeah. do that, right, right. And so, and, and also too, um, with that film, I wanted to look not just at the, the, the black people, but how this was affecting the, the, the whites. Right. And what it meant to actually, what it means to actually have to give up economically. Right, right. It's a tough. It's a tough thing. So, what's your assessment of South Africa now? In oh my gosh, 2019. I know, and it's been a, a few years since I've I've been back. But you know, I had a student actually who was there this summer and who covered the hearings because it's the hearings around land reform because it's still going on. Right. And so we were. I was really jiving with his his project, his master's thesis, because it was totally these issues sure. that I had I had delved into. All right. We have a we have a clip from from oh, yes. Land. Let's let's take a quick look at that. Over the last ten years, less than three percent of agricultural land has been transferred to those who were dispossessed in the past. This is unsustainable, and it's a ticking time bomb. You must get your land back. We are the landowners. We must protect the value of our land. Chalera! Commercial white farmers. All that they want is to make profits. When we don't have anywhere to live, we want our land back, and we want it now. Right, and we want we want it now. And I yes. was in South Africa when Nelson Mandela was released, yeah. and so I saw that the, the, the faces of hope, you know, people who expected, you know, there to be some miracle and everything would change. That's right. And, yeah, and obviously, as we know, from our experience here in this country, yes. a lot of times progress is made and then right. we go a few steps backwards. Right, right. And um, I think that's what's happening in yeah. South Africa. So you, you mentioned your student and his yes. work. Let's uh, tell us quickly about the expansion of, the, of your program. Absolutely. Right? We're <laughs> really excited. So I am at the Newmark School of Journalism, a graduate school. Um, it's a three semester program. Uh, students, incoming students, will now have the opportunity to concentrate specifically in documentary filmmaking. Um, so really that means that they can, you know, when they apply um, or even when they get in that first semester, they can choose to uh, really specialize and concentrate in documentary filmmaking and come out with a, a short doc. Um, you know, the documentary film world is exploding. They say we're in the sure. golden age right. of documentary filmmaking, and we want to prepare our students to take advantage of that. Right. No longer, you know, the poor little sister of That's right. the big feature films. <laughs> That's as, right. As we are in right. Or eating your spinach. <laughs> That's right. That's what they used to say. So it's really exciting. Well, that's great. We always ask our guests to finish the statement, the power, the strength of black America lies in. What is that oh. to you? Power, strength of black America. Lies in women. Ah. In women. We don't get that answer very yes, often. Yes, that's, that's. Tell us, tell us why. Well, How? because we are the, we are the backbone of our community. We are, and not only that, um, I was following Stacey Abrams for another project. Yes, we, oh, oh, really? Oh, <laughs> yes. Literally. Yes, with the rest literally of filming, us. Exactly. Idealistically, you know, and right? The thing about following the, the, what was going on in, in Atlanta and the, the work around to, to get Stacey elected, uh, which she missed by only a small mark because of, you know, yes. other things. But women, when you, when women are elected office, when black women are elected office, we take care of everybody. Mm. That's the thing that we're not, we are we take care of everybody. We are not interested in focusing just on you know, one particular community. And so when you elect black women to office and when you honor and respect African-American women, you know, you're gonna get a better society. <laughs> that's, just, that's just the way it is. Shirley Chisholm, 
right behind yeah. you. I know. You know? <laughs> so Purposefully. Exactly. Right behind me. She's got yeah, my back. <laughs> that's right. So, you know, I, I honestly believe that. And, you know, my biggest influence was my mom, who was a writer, a playwright, um, and who was a political person. And, you know, her universality in terms of uh, stories, right. writing stories about everybody and about uh, equality and justice. That's, you know, I think that's what we do. Okay, well, thank you. The power of the strength of black America. Women, love it. <laughs> and you're Ruba Rich and love your film. It's The thank Green you. Book, Guide to Freedom. And it's on the Smithsonian Channel and it will be everywhere after a very short time. Thank you so right. much for being thank with us you. today. Thank you for your work. Pleasure. And thanks to you all out there as well for joining us. I'm Carol Jenkins. The program is Black America. We'll see you the next time. Thank you.